This is our 10th anniversary of Urban Shield. We're very proud of the training we put on in this region. We believe it's the best training in the nation for all first responders. You only have to look a few months back to see the problems that have arose throughout law enforcement. So we believe that we need intense training for intense times. We know that we have to work together, so we have to train together in order for us to succeed together. And we'd like to make sure that this training continues on to be the best training in the world for all of our first responders. Um, I heard about Urban Shield from community activists who were concerned about it about five years ago. The reasons for opposing Urban Shield were as much about the blatant militarism, the blatant violence, racism that it really embodied. So um, the more I learned, the more I could see that SWAT teams were practicing for 48 hours, practicing killing people with very few alternatives for de-escalation or for other kinds of outcomes. The fact that Urban Shield became a toxic issue, just saying Urban Shield at some point became toxic, right? People knew it was a bad thing. The question was just how do we put an end to it? Started Urban Shield in 2007 to better prepare Alameda County special response units and our citizens for a critical event or mass shooting. It's my obligation to make sure we have teams that are ready to respond to those events so that we can protect and save people that are involved in that. Uh, several things about it made was unique. One is that it was a continuous 48-hour training exercise where nobody else in the nation was running exercises that duration. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we could test the physical fitness and the capabilities of our team over a prolonged event. Law enforcement agencies from around the world are convening right here in the Bay Area for a five-day Urban Shield event. It's funded by the Department of Homeland Security. The Bay Area about to become the center of the law enforcement world. It was militarizing police forces by promoting um, military-grade weaponry and scenarios that are really set up in order to kill people. We also have teams from throughout the uh, entire world come out to compete. Israel has been out uh, a number of times because of major events that were going on in Brazil. They had their core team come out. They've been here in 2013 and 2014. They wanted to come because of the uh, World Cup soccer games they had and the Olympic competition that they had. So they wanted to see uh, if their team was adequately trained and prepared for providing security to those type of things. Well, years ago, um, and I actually showed this several times to a couple of boards of supervisors, I came upon a vendor's video, and it was an attack on a BART train, a real, literal BART train. Get us out of hey, here. you guys, stand up! Help. Everybody, stand Help. up right now! Hey, one of the hostages with the uh, Bob Autumn is holding a remote switch, and they told him to not let go of it. I got a Bob! Move, 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 move! Move, move, move! ID, ID, ID! Get up! They pulled into a BART station and then they did this exercise 48 times over in two days with SWAT teams coming through and attacking the BART train. And I just... I, I, I had a sense that this kind of training would inevitably result in the death of everyone. Um, the sheriff was very uh, reluctant to shift that narrative or shift that training in a way that would be responsive, not just communities that are concerned about militarization and racism, but also our need for emergency preparedness for other kinds of disasters. It was about terrorism. So all of our training and exercise programs and scenarios had to have some nexus to terrorism. Uh, I am obligated to do certain things and we have to train our people to put them in front of harm's way. And Urban Shield was 
in my opinion, the best way to do that. They have different opinions. You'd have to ask them why they didn't see it the way I do. Uh, we met at least about, about five years ago. They were in need of uh, training products for Wonder to narrow that they need to the, uh, the urban assault for the Amtrak station. We don't do the filming for them. We film ourselves and do promotional aspect of it for the event. But mostly we do it ourselves. It's not a request to have it done. And we then started to see uh, really significant gains against Urban Shield and popular opposition to it um, in 2014. That was also the year that, as a result of Mike Brown's murder, you had communities in Ferguson take to the streets and were met with extremely militarized police repression. Back in 1999, police hesitated to enter the school. <laughs> So at the time, there were a whole bunch of active shooters. Right? Mm -hmm. and I watched Columbine shoot. And at Columbine, I watched tactical units stage outside and have guns on a building and not make entry. Mm -hmm. They waited for a SWAT team to come in. And the SWAT team took an excess of 90 minutes to organize, set up, and go. And 90 minutes is a long time. Mm -hmm. I said, it's not going to happen well, I'm sure. I think the tipping point for me was seeing more and more um, pictures and video and press reports of what was actually happening. And I found a couple of vendors videos and promotional videos and everything that I watched just convinced me more and more that this was essentially pushing policing in exactly the wrong direction. And so all that is not just for its own experience. It's so that we're better coordinated for the real things that really hit us in real life every now and then. And when they do, we are far better responding the way we do because of the lessons from Urban Shield. AROC, as a, an, an Arab-based, an Arab and Muslim organization, we immediately, our entire membership and organization was very much appalled about the fact that the sheriff was able to administer this program in the Bay for so many years already, but especially since he was using the war on terror, right, as a framework, um, and it was happening on the weekend of 9-11. You can see 9-11 on video and on the news, but until you stood there with it on fire, I can't even describe in words what it looked like in real life. And the feeling of anger that you got when you stood there was just tremendous. Like, you wanted to go get these guys that did this to us. It was really personal. So very easily, um, folks in the Arab and Muslim community were clearly against this militarization program. Um, and so we helped form the Stop Urban Shield Coalition because we were clear from the beginning, we didn't want to change Urban Shield, we didn't want to reform Urban Shield, we wanted to end it. We started to organize to say, this is not just damaging because of the racism and militarization. Um, we need to be supporting exercises and training that are community-centered and that are focused on the kinds of disasters we're more likely to face. From there, we actually worked to put together a coalition of different organizations that were committed to stopping Urban Shield. And why do you feel so comfortable calling Sheriff Ahern a racist? Uh, he has not done, done anything that proves otherwise. Do you think that's enough? That he just hasn't done anything that proves otherwise? You know, right now in the national discussion, there's this big question on what is racism and what isn't racism? And I think if we get, if we're still stuck in this day and age in 2019, where we can't see racism for what it is, rather than questioning what is or isn't racist, what we should be doing is actually challenging racism everywhere and calling it for what it is. I've called the sheriff racist many times to his face. And I'm used to white men yelling at me, I can handle it. And the reason we do that is because he's done all it takes to prove that, right? Throughout the first few years of Urban Shield, Muslim stereotypes were used to portray terrorists. Images acquired from Urban Shield show some human targets with added facial hair. These were executed by the San Francisco County Sheriff's Office in 2012. Sheriff Ahern initially justified the use of the tropes, explaining that the scenarios were based on real-life events. 
Ahern claims to have removed the tropes after backlash. Urban Shield was um, is a regional ex was a regional exercise um, being held in in uh, twelve different counties in the Bay Area, but there was a, a vendor show that highlighted um, police equipment, especially guns. The Urban Shield Weapons Expo was a place for weapons manufacturers to gather and basically market their products to law enforcement. My name is Evan Huddleston with Halo Drop, and uh, today we're here at Urban Shield with Rap4. I just want to—I want to show you guys something really special that we've been working on. Um, I would say that we 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 more like getting exposure than sales. The major aspect of going to a trade show is not doing the sales; it's having the exposure. Um, Urban Shield is a great venue, not just for the officers that involved to give them the ability to kind of go through the scenario to see what they're training all about. Um, and that was for a number of years being held in Oakland at the Marriott Hotel. In response to protests, uh, particularly around uh, t-shirts that said Black Rifles Matter um, as, and, and the, the focus on firearms in a city that is heavily impacted by gun violence. Um, the city of Oakland decided, okay, we're not going to host this vendor show anymore, and it was moved out to the Alameda County Fairgrounds um, out in Pleasanton. In kicking Urban Shield out of Oakland, that was a small victory for us, showing the power that we have as a coalition, as this growing movement to put an end to Urban Shield. Our end goal wasn't to just have it be moved around across the Bay Area. We wanted to end it. So we, from the very beginning, were clear on the fact that we were going to use a legislative tactic. We were going to use media. We're out here trying to stop Urban Shield. And most of the outcomes are killing people. It's about making war on our community. Local law enforcement emergency responders from all over the United States to train in war games training, essentially, um, on how to further criminalize black and brown community members. We were going to use, you know, outreach. Um, we were going to do real grassroots organizing. All of those tactics were necessary to put an end to this really large program and take on the Alameda County Sheriff's Office. Well, my big concern about the program, which matched some of the, um, the advocates, was that it was increasingly very militarized in a time when there's a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of um, clashes uh, between law enforcement and the people in the community. And there were very, some particular things that were being pointed out, like the use of racist um, uh, symbols and uh, sales, um, sales of inappropriate t-shirts at the event. So after the Urban Shield Weapons Expo left Oakland, we started to mobilize hard in Pleasanton. 2016, there was a huge mobilization that shut down the Alameda County Fairgrounds in Pleasanton, where the Urban Shield Expo was taking place. So we um, worked a lot, focused a lot on the Board of Supervisors in Alameda County, which um, was the body that had to accept the federal grant that supported Urban Shield. And so the board said, we're, um, this is the last time we are approving funding for Urban Shield as currently constituted. And they appointed an ad hoc committee to study and to redesign Urban Shield. And when the board voted to uh, er end Urban Shield as currently constituted in uh, 2018, was that a vote to end Urban Shield completely or just end Urban Shield the way it was happening? Uh, 2018... Um well, we basically wanted to end the program. Didn't necessarily mean that we didn't want to still have programs in the county to bring together the region around emergency situations um, that might exist. Um, but we didn't like the way the program was being done. On March 27, 2018, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors created the Ad Hoc Committee on Urban Shield. The committee was tasked with consulting the sheriff to recommend changes to Urban Shield. At the same time, an Alameda County grand jury was following the controversy and litigation surrounding Urban Shield, which meant the 19-person grand jury sat in on all 11 ad hoc committee meetings. My name is David Sains, and uh, I was a member of uh, the grand jury that wrote a, a report on the Urban Shield program. Well, I'm an attorney by uh, 
by train. Uh, graduated from Berkeley Law back in the 70s. Uh, after law school, I worked in the FBI for a number of years. And how did you become involved with the grand jury? Well, my, my career has always involved working somewhere else in the world, even though I'm an Oakland kid. And for most of my adult life, I've lived in the Bay Area. Uh, and I've never had the opportunity to do something local before. And so we would go out to the Pleasanton Fairgrounds and watch some of the proceedings, watch some of the, uh, the trainings going on. Hey, bud, keep your, keep your hands up. Just drop the knife for me. Who else is in there? I don't know. No. Okay, do me a favor. Hey, nobody wants to hurt you, all right? Just come walking out. Nobody, nobody has, uh, you don't have any other weapons, do you? No. Okay, come on out. Keep your hands up. Put your hands on top of your head. What's your name? I don't know. Okay, turn around, face away from me. Walk backwards towards my voice. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. And so we were aware of the program. We were also aware that there was some controversy associated with the program. Um, they put together then a ad hoc committee that came up with recommendations for what would come after Urban Shield. Um, so I was on that committee with four other uh, appointees by super of the supervisors. We were a wide range. We included a police officer, um, two supervisors, staff, a lifelong emergency preparedness professional and myself. So every supervisor chose one member of the uh, ad hoc committee. So five supervisors, five members of the ad hoc committee. They had a charge that they were going to work with the sheriff to get results. Uh, it was obvious to us right from the start that the working relationship was not at all uh, present. We saw no evidence, no visible evidence of any working partnership. Do you feel like you had a meaningful relationship with the ad hoc? I do not. Do you feel like the ad hoc had a meaningful relationship with the sheriff? Yes. Uh, the, the, the assignment was to work with the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't say you have to have a meaningful relationship, which it's, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret meaningful relationship. I agree with the grand jury report on how they selected people that were absolutely against uh, our program. Actually, we're uh, members of organizations that have gone uh, above and beyond to stop our program. Uh, the ad hoc committee uh, did not want to uh, negotiate on their terms and it was uh, difficult to work with. It, was, it, it could be seen as a conflict of interest that you were in the Stop Urban Shield Coalition, but you were to make recommendations on the program that was going to be similar to Urban Shield. It was not going to be similar to Urban Shield. The, the Board of Supervisors had decided that Urban Shield was over as currently constituted. So I don't see any conflict there. Well, as detailed in the grand jury report, our perceptions were that the members of the ad hoc committee all came to the table with some preconceived notions of uh, Urban Shield. There was never really a, an open objective discussion that, that we witnessed, uh, and that was surprising. I think it was a committee that took their job very seriously, and I wouldn't agree that they um, um, came in um, wanting to have a negative relationship with the sheriff. We ended up making uh, uh, 63 recommendations that focused um, more on, uh, on the kinds of disasters we face in the region, on prevention and, and recovery, as well as response. Good afternoon, my name is Brian Matthews. I'm a captain with the Hayward Police Department. Currently serving as the 911 Communications Director in San Mateo County. And I'm here to show my support for Urban Shield. It seems that this is arguably the most valuable training that exists. And if the funding were to change dramatically, that training will just go somewhere else. I'm here to ask you to adopt all of the recommendations of the task force. The ad hoc committee that you appointed has come up with a list of really inspiring recommendations. A program like Urban Shield can exist be inclusive of the community and address their concerns 
while accomplishing the goal of training first responders. Ms. And in light of other speakers speaking over time, I'm going to continue. Oh, please, no, 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 hold, hold on. Please Let's forgive me. Ms. Kimmel, Ms. Kimmel. Um, they asked us to confer with the sheriff, which we did. And the response of the sheriff was, if you do this, then the grant will be pulled. He claimed that um, the, some of them, some of the recommendations would have violated grant guidelines. They have a number of recommendations that uh, were more than happy to, to work with. It's just the ones that would be in violation of law, MOU, or the grant that I can't comply with. Sheriff Ahern claims some ad hoc committee recommendations violated the Bay Area Uwasi grant guidelines. The Uwasi grant funds Urban Shield, along with other emergency preparedness training in the Bay Area. Any recommendation that would give the ad hoc committee authority and oversight and guiding the Bay Area Uwasi, in my opinion, would be in violation of the terms of the grant. All of the recommendations that you received regarding oversight, you need to accept every single one of those because this event is happening with totally inadequate oversight. Um, I did an estimate based on what the data that the sheriff's office provided us and calculated about five million dollars from county money was being used just from the sheriff's office for this ex exercise uh, and the funding from the federal grant was 1.7 million. The grant funding is about 5.5 million dollars on an annual basis and about three million of that was spent on other training involving emergency managers and other people responsible for uh, their response to critical events. Uh, knowing the number of speakers, I'd just like to make a, a couple of comments. Is, yes, sir. Uh, uh, in regards to many of the recommendations, the recommendations are deal with uh, responding to uh, catastrophes or natural disasters. Not very many of them refer to terror. And the grant funds that we acquire, the grant specifically directs us to work on terrorism. They're, they're saying at the meeting, representatives of the sheriff's office had had alerted you that, but they weren't um, to the nature of don't do this. I mean, it, sometimes it was. It was, okay. but we did not receive that level of detail. Uh, he did say a couple different times, um, you want to be careful that this doesn't conflict which, with the um, Homeland Security guidelines and the NOFO. But he never said which specific recommendations might have come into conflict. In my view, this is a last minute effort by the sheriff. So, Mr. President, uh, that, that's not accurate. Yeah, go ahead, Sheriff. That's not accurate. Uh, and we couldn't determine anything in the grant guidelines that was in conflict with the recommendations that we had made. And even at, during the hearings, it wasn't really clear when we called up the representative of the um, UASI who was there they couldn't really enumerate for us really what, which, exactly which recommendations were against the guidelines. I've read the 63 uh, opinions, recommendations of the ad hoc committee, and I find some of them to be unrealistic and not in compliance with industry standards, best practices, or the UASI grant guidelines. Could you uh, be more specific and mention the three, give me three of the ones that clearly are totally and contrary to the UIC um, guidelines and grants? I, I will just go ahead and, and tell you that the, the recommendations that the chief did not uh, adhere to, the I one... No, but I'm asking you for your opinion since you have identified yourself as an authority. Well, I, I only have two minutes. I didn't I, label I'm, each I'm giving one. you more than two minutes to answer that question. All right, since you've given me... And, and I want you to be specific. That's okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sorry. I wasn't prepared to do that. I didn't you, list them in if that If you regard. made those comments, you should be prepared to back them up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.
So that, that remained fuzzy throughout the process. The lawyer from Bay Area, Uwasi, also testified that some recommendations violated grant guidelines. I, uh, I believe I'm at liberty to say that I did inform the general uh, manager that it was my opinion that some of the recommendations uh, did appear to run counter to language in the grant guidelines. Some of the recommendations could be perceived by the federal administration to run counter to their grant requirements. Representatives of Bay Area Uwasi sided with the sheriff in their assessment that some recommendations violated grant guidelines. In a February 22nd email, the sheriff stated Uwasi agreed the lack of terrorism focus would doom the federal funding. I never saw any of these final recommendations. I've just heard about discussions that they had during the uh, meetings that they had. And the first time I saw this was about February 21st or so, the Monday or Tuesday that, that they delivered it to us. Uh, and the supervisors, for your information, received the final recommendations just, I think it was Thursday or Friday. So that was the first time we saw them as well. So there is a sense of uh, that we are rushing this. Why is it that we didn't, someone didn't push to start earlier so that we wouldn't be in this situation where we're final hour? It also appeared that the board really didn't have a very clear understanding of what they were embracing, what they were endorsing. There was confusion. There might have been an opportunity to rescue this and do some more work before decisions were taken, but that didn't happen. Decisions were taken. It seemed like no one was really sure what they were deciding on. So if I could just respond back to that one thing is, is that uh, we did attend all the meetings. However, our opportunity to provide information was limited to like two minutes, just like it is here today. So it's difficult for us to go into get into the, a lot of the detail. I've probably spoken more now than I've ever was allowed to go ahead and do there. The intricacies of the grant, as well as putting it in jeopardy, I, I mean, when would that have come up? It was stated several times um, throughout the course of our meetings. The way that we were able to get past it uh, as I mentioned earlier, was um, with the understanding that our role was advisory mm -hmm. and that we did not have the, the authority to make those decisions. Our, our goal was to, bri to provide the best recommendations that we could, given the information that we had, and I believe that we did that. I did want to talk about the sheriff, and I believe also uh, Aaron, Aaron Armstrong said that the sheriff did bring up points of contention during the meeting, but you're saying that that's not the case. Phil White was not representing the sheriff's office. Phil White said that there would be grant, there would be issues I'm, with I'm grant guidelines. The sheriff, the sheriff didn't. But I, the reason why I suggest that I, I mentioned Phil White is that at other times, people said he, he was working for the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. So although that's not how he represented himself to us, so I think that the sheriff's that that's what Aaron is referring to, mm -hmm. is that Phil White said these things. Why didn't they heed your concerns? Pardon me? How come they didn't heed your concerns? Because uh, I, it's my opinion that uh, they didn't want the program to continue. Would you agree that tactical training is necessary for uh, to mitigate against a terrorist attack, um, assuming that the terrorist is armed? I'm not an expert on tactical training, so I wouldn't be able to respond to that question. I'm not a law enforcement person, so that's hard for me to say. Um, is, is there a need for tactical training? Um, there might be a need for certain kinds of capabilities. Exactly what kind of training and how much you need um, to be able to deal with something like that, I really am not, I can't say because I'm not in that field. Some of the recommendations were being made from people that never have been involved with a, a tactical response. Uh, they had, uh, the recommendations came from people that had never been in a patrol car, never worked a, a search warrant, never worked with uh, armed suspects. Uh, why would I want to take information from people that didn't have expertise when most of our program is based on people with great level of experience guiding us to the best national practices on how to respond to active shooters? I think it'd be irresponsible not to support Urban Shield and the training associated with that 
because there were some flaws in the beginning. I think the sheriff has shown uh, the, his willingness to compromise. The, the motion that's before us right now, I certainly can't support, and I won't, along with Supervisor Miley, I guess. Before voting on the recommendations, the supervisors told the ad hoc committee and the sheriff to compromise. We worked intensively over six months. We met a dozen times. We had eight-hour meetings. Uh, we met extensively with the sheriff. The sheriff had lots of input in every meeting. I mean, I don't think that we saw in those meetings any evidence that there was a spirit of working together. So it, it, we were not asked to come up with recommendations that the sheriff's office wanted. Well, that was not what we were asked to do. To us, it seemed if that were to continue, uh, it would be very surprising for anything positive to emerge out of this process. Um, I believe in faith, but this, is a, this would be a big leap. It, if it comes back to bite us and we lose this grant, then uh, I'm going to have nobody to blame but myself. Uh, and then my constituents, the people that I work for in my district, are going to uh, talk to me uh, seriously about the loss that they've incurred as a result of this vote. For consensus, there were seven items that we found consensus on. We reached conditional consensus on seven items. There were four items that we had no consensus on. That's recommendation 15, 24, 36, and 56. There was no discussion on 15 of the items due to time. It's my understanding that if you approve 31, as is, as I told you 13 times in the last meeting, is it will jeopardize the grant funding. To this day, we still don't know what would be allowed and what wouldn't be allowed and what disqualifies and what doesn't disqualify. It was very late. It was, it was too late. And we had no way of verifying. And the fact the committee didn't even get around to what, 15 of them or how many? Correct, 15. Yeah, to 15 of them makes for a very bad process, right? I'm not going to support the motion. I guess once again, I made it clear. I'm not going to take any action that's going to jeopardize the funding. And then furthermore, if it jeopardizes funding, it jeopardizes uh, effective training uh, throughout the region. We're talking about three cities, San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco, as well as 12 counties. There might be three votes for that, but I'm not going to be one of those three votes. I would like to move item 31.1 and 31.2. But Mr. Chair, if you do that, you're approving all the items where there was con consensus and conditional consensus. And so essentially, you're, con you're approving everything. Would you like a roll call? Yes, please. Supervisor Haggerty? Why am I always first? Just because I'm just one? Yes. On the motion, no. Supervisor Chan? Yes. Supervisor Miley? No. Supervisor Carson? Yes. President Valle? Yes. Three ayes. Thank you. What your motion just did was ruin our chances not to have grant, have that training controlled by all the accounts. So that's your action. So, so done. We hope that you'll do your best on behalf of our county sheriff. Thank you. It was a three to two vote. Uh, Supervisor Richard Valle was the sort of deciding vote, and uh, he deserves a lot of credit for sticking to his guns. The Alameda County Board of Supervisors passed recommendations that said you can't have SWAT scenarios, you can't have this kind of invasive surveillance technology being used. They chose to embrace all the recommendations put forward in spite of uh, uh, warnings from certainly from the sheriff's office and perhaps others, that adopting all the recommendations would put the uh, federal funding at risk for the Urban Shield program and the broader training program that Alameda County had administrative authority over thanks to the federal funds that came out of the uh, Bay Area WASI. Uh, so WASI did make that threat and to the credit of the Board of Supervisors they said, well, we will go ahead if you implement the recommendations of our task force, and if you don't, then go ahead and pull the grant. So, so that's what happened. If the federal government determined that the Bayer Uwasi was in violation of the terms of the grant, 
they'd be required to refund that money to the federal government. They did not want to jeopardize that program and put it in that position where they have to return the $5.5 million. Sheriff Ahern said he voluntarily ended Urban Shield for the sake of avoiding grant violations altogether. Members of the Bay Area Uwasi Approval Authority voted to reallocate the $5.5 million for 2019. The funds were split between 12 Bay Area regions for smaller emergency preparedness activities. And it was within a couple of days after the, the, the county supervisors made their decision that the federal uh, funding was revoked from Alameda County and we lost $5 million for uh, terrorism training preparedness. That seemed like it was a, something worth saving. So the, in this year, 2019, um, that pot of money, which is $4.7 million, was divided up um, in the 12 county region. Um, and the emergency preparedness agencies, fire, police, EMS, are using it for existing training in, in their areas. What do we know about natural gas? Flammable, yeah, it's flammable. Um, it goes boom. Every year we host an annual activation of volunteers citywide, and we choose uh, generally a schoolyard. And what was the sheriff's response to all of this? The sheriff was really immature in the way that he handled the Board of Supervisors deciding to end Urban Shield. The sheriff pulled out. He put his hands up in the air and said, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. Do you think it was ultimately the best decision to have the grant pulled? Yeah, I do. I think the kind of training that was done by Urban Shield was significantly reinforcing some of the worst excesses of cop behavior. Police brutality, overreacting, excessive use of violence, ca catastrophizing, uh, the use of ethnic and racial stereotyping. And what would your response be to a... Uh... I, I talked to a Muhammad Sheikh, and he said that you were very immature in your handling of, of the uh, supervisor's decision. Well, I, I disagree. I've had a very cordial meeting with uh, almost everyone I've talked to. And that, in that regard, uh, we're very transparent with our program. I actually had Frank Somerville come and participate. I've done hundreds of interviews in regards to our program. So uh, I don't know why you would uh, make that statement. But we won at the end of the day. And we won because we are on the right side of history. We won because we proved that Urban Shield was not only racist, it was dangerous. And it was negatively impacting our communities. And most importantly, it wasn't meeting the needs of the Bay Area. And that $5 million that was going to Urban Shield can now actually go to real disaster preparedness. When you hold it, hold it here and don't squeeze down right Because when you pull a pin, you start squeezing, it's going to shoot down. To this day, you don't really know which, which uh, guidelines the sheriff was bringing up when he said that certain recommendations by him? Um, well, the, I, I mean, I have his list of the list that he presented to us a day or so before. Um, but I'm not really, I'm not sure if that's really, if that's the definitive list. But you're comfortable with the position you took? Oh, absolutely. Our Urban Shield program allowed the new people to build relationships with the people that existed in, in other positions. So down the road, in two or three years, those relationships will no longer be in existence. I think the outcome, in, in the long run, that's probably for the better, because I, I think this particular sheriff is not well suited for community-centered preparedness. The funding is still there, it's just not allocated towards urban uh -huh. shield. But the 2020 funding is gonna go towards some other person to host the mm -hmm. training and exercise program. Assuming it's going to be San Francisco or some other big agency, what if they start up another Urban Shield program? Because that's the 2020 money is not going necessarily to somebody else to host an exercise program like Urban. Like that sounds like another Urban Shield. The 2020 money is now open for people to use for trainings and and disaster preparedness. And but what assuming they start another Urban Shield program? Well, it'll get fought by the organizers of where that location is. The second coming of Urban Shield, like Urban Shield 2.0? Yeah. Then what? What are you asking Let's about? just say there's a Urban Shield 2.0. Would you start up Stop Urban Shield Coalition 2.0? Uh, you know, it's not an individual who starts a coalition. Um, 
I suspect that if the new program were almost the same as Urban Shield, a lot of people would be upset. But I don't think that's what's going to happen. What should people take from the Grand Jury Report? That we shouldn't allow something like this to happen again. You know, when there's something that's important to the citizens of the county, I think it's, it's incumbent upon our leaders to uh, pay attention, to, to be careful how they approach the issue, how they look at an issue, uh, to be thoughtful about it, and not to allow something to just kind of be delegated and then just, you're kind of, uh, when you come up for a decision, that's the first time that you're really thinking about it, you make a decision just because you want to move on to the next item. And the idea that that would result in a thoughtful, well-reasoned decision that benefits the entire county seems pretty much a stretch of the imagination. And now you're sad to see it go? Pardon me? And you're sad to see it go? I'm very sad to see it go. Yeah. I believe it's the best program in the nation for first responders and tactical teams, by far. So as of right now, Urban Shield and the Vendor Show, it's dead? It's dead. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah, Urban Shield is, is done. I'd like to thank each and every one of you and all of you who have participated in Urban Shield and supported our Urban Shield program. Your dedication and passion has made our community stronger, safer, and more resilient, and what we believe, better prepared. You are the true heroes, so for that, I thank you. Keep up the great work and be safe.